Hi, this is uh, Jake Siri here, and I'm presenting my project about the mountain car problem. Now, just to give a very brief synopsis of what mountain car is, you have a car and it's driving, you know, up a hill. And in order to get up the hill, it needs momentum from actually driving in reverse up the hill. So, um, you know, it's not a simple matter of just drive forward till you hit the flag. And we want to use machine learning to get it to figure out that it needs to drive left first. So um, here's the program I wrote to uh, solve this problem. Uh, this stuff is just, you know, some preliminaries. Uh, the kernel's all reset, by the way, so there are no variables saved right now. Uh, so I'm actually going to be running the code live as I do this explanation. Uh, here's just a bunch of importing that I thought I was going to have to do. Uh, some of these ended up being not so useful, but, you know, that's okay. Um, it's always important to import, you know, NumPy, that's pretty much universally useful, and Torch, you know, for any machine learning project, one would think that that's kind of a handy thing to have. Now, this line right here, it um, sets up matplotlib, and it sets a... Uh, torch to use a GPU if one's available. I'm actually running this on Jupyter Notebook and it's using my system. I don't have an NVIDIA GPU, so unfortunately this uh, program isn't using a GPU to do the linear algebra. However, that ended up being okay and I'll explain why when I get there. Now this line right here, it just sort of initializes uh, the environment and makes a new gym environment in of type mountain car v0 and if we run it it also takes a few random actions and then shows them on screen just sort of to confirm that we're indeed running the mountain car environment um, but the main point is it's initialized uh, the next line right here is a get height function uh, it takes the horizontal position and it returns the height that corresponds to this universal position. If we go to the uh, source code for the, the mountain car environment, we see that they define height as three times the X position. You take the sine of that, multiply by 0.45, add 0.55. So I just decided to do the exact same height function. I did uh, consider using this in my reward function and I tried it a couple times and it wasn't really working out. I ended up with situations where the car felt it was doing good enough by just driving to the left up the hill and it wasn't really going for the flag enough. So uh, I kind of took that part out, but uh, it's worth playing with. You know, maybe if I gave it a lower weight, it would have ended up helping. Uh, however, the final reward function I went up with um, is it actually returns two instead of one, which is the default. The default is um, it'll return one if it makes it to the flag, and it will return zero if it does, or excuse me, it'll return negative one if it doesn't end up making it to the flag, which is kind of garbage for machine learning. You kind of want to guide it in the right direction for reinforcement learning in particular. So um, instead, um, I have it return two if it reaches the flag, i.e. if its x position is greater than 0 0.5, which is where the flag is, and if not, then um, I have it return negative 1 plus, so the, the farthest back x position is negative 1.2, so I add 1.2, and the farthest right is 0. 0.6, so I added 1.2 to that, so this is sort of like a fraction of how far right you are um, as a percentage of how far right you can possibly go. So the highest this can be is one and the lowest it could be is zero if you're all the way to the left. It adds that amount to negative one. So this returns anything from negative one to zero. It sort of rewards the car for going a bit farther right. Now here's actually where we get into the machine learning aspect of things and I'll go over this in depth. But first, what we wanna do is we actually are going to run the algorithm um, I have it set to show the first five episodes and the last five episodes of um, of a given call to the function. So um, this is just showing the first five episodes. Notice how it's not really 
do accomplishing all that much and that's because it hasn't learned anything yet yep as we could see um i have it mark when the first clear happens it happened on episode 101 this time uh usually it ends up happening somewhere in the 200 to 300 range sometimes i get late 100s 101 is actually very early but uh you know it is partially based on random chance so i guess i got lucky this time um and it prints every 100 episodes the average reward up till that point um in theory this should keep increasing you know so it starts out at negative 123 as you can see, it's sort of trending upwards, but it's not perfect. We kind of have a very low number of trials, only 1,000. And um, hmm, as we can see here, this is actually a very bad first pass of the algorithm. Uh, not one of the last five trials actually made it, despite having a first clear on episode 101. So, uh... We're going to show the plot for the average reward. And as we can see, it's generally increasing. So it's getting closer to the, um, it's getting closer to the flag. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to get it to consistently get to the flag. Uh, maybe this time it'll be a bit better. All right, so I've run this one more time. And um, in a bit, we're going to see the last five trials, see how they go. Hopefully it's a bit better. Yeah, there, it made it. All right, it was on its way. Made it there. All right, so there it made it uh, two of the five last tries, but the average reward was negative 96. Now, to be honest, I'm not quite sure why the, uh, <laughs> the reward values are so low, but negative 96 is actually quite good. Um, so we're going to actually plot this and, uh, we see that the average reward is trending up, which means it's learning, which is exactly what we want. Now, right here, I actually have plotted the, um, the Q table and, um, I'm going to explain why it looks the way it does. But what we're going to do now is we're going to change our gamma value to, from 0.9 to 0.999 and change our number of trials from 1,000 to 10,000. Now, while this is going on, um, I'm going to explain the algorithm. I'm gonna explain exactly what's going on. So here, you notice that the very first thing we do is we discretize the state space. So what does that mean? Well, basically, um, the car has two state variables, the velocity and the position, uh, and you know, these are floating point numbers, but floating point numbers, there are a lot of those. So we're going to multiply the position by 10 and multiply the velocity by 50. And then we're going to round to the nearest integer. And that'll essentially give us 19 different position states and eight different velocity states, depending on what's closest. The reason is because the Q table otherwise would be infinite and impossible to work with. So we need to discretize it like this. Now here we initialize the Q table to a bunch of random values. We also save a copy of it. That's for later when we make the plots. And we also have two arrays that are tracking the rewards. Um, that's how you saw the average reward being calculated. This parameter epsilon, I make a copy of it and I'll show you guys why later. Um, and this is just a variable to keep track of what episode the first success occurred at. Um, so now here's here's the big deal. The actual, you know, making the Q table learn a little bit. We have a select number of episodes. We go through each episode. Essentially, here's, here's the heart and soul of the algorithm right here, this if-then statement. It takes uh, one of three actions and the Q table is supposed to predict the amount of reward it'll get from each of the three actions. So the Q table is 19 by 8, which is all the states, by 3, which is all the actions. So for every state, it'll have a saved expected reward for all three actions. And it'll either choose the highest one with probability given by uh, 1 minus epsilon, or it'll 
choose a random one. Now this epsilon decays over time, so at first uh, the algorithm will be all exploratory, but then at the end it becomes a little more um, rigid and wants to do what it needs to be successful versus exploring. So that's how you get a sort of dynamic algorithm. Um, now as you saw my uh, reward function from earlier, um, it comes into use right here. Uh, so this Q value actually gets updated with each trial. Essentially, if it iterates this a bunch of times, as you go along, the Q values get more and more accurate to the actual reward you expect. Remember, when we initialized them, these were all random values. So uh, this, is, this is why it's learning. Now, if there are any clears, of course, it'll uh, show the very first one and what episode it occurred at. So um, that's, you know, obviously important if you want to know how fast you can complete Mountain Cart once. Um, completing Mountain Cart once isn't very hard. Um, at first I was having trouble because I actually tried, you know, 50 by 100 discretization. And the problem with that is that there are too many states and they don't get updated enough. You know, it's less likely that each one is going to be updated. So it takes forever for the Q table to learn. So I actually discretized the states with very few values. And um, this actually made it learn a lot faster to get to the flag, which is how we were able to, as soon as episode 100, get a clear. These just keep track of the words. This, we decay epsilon every pass through. So we multiply epsilon by that eps1 value I saved earlier. And yeah, this is just stuff to attra the, track the awards. Um, it's not really important to the actual Q algorithm, but it's important to the data we're gonna display below. All right, so that's basically it. Now, you notice that we didn't really use any extremely you know, deep learning. We just use you know, a very basic lear learning algorithm. And uh, in order to solve this problem, you don't really need deep learning. Uh, you just need, you know, this Q value. It, it's definitely learning, but it's not, uh, it's not a super deep neural network. Yeah, my computer was able to successfully run this, even though it doesn't really have a great GPU. Uh, I tried to do this product on Google Colab, actually, and I intended to use a deep network Problem was I wasn't able to get Jim to display the environment in Google Colab. So uh, this, you know, this also works. And frankly, uh, it uses a lot less computing power that way. So it's more efficient and it gets it done faster. You know, I had a clear on episode, what was it, 101 earlier? You know, that's much better than you would get with a deep neural network. It just, you know, the deep neural network would be better at getting consistent results after the fact. Anyway, we've, uh, we've talked about this for a while and we're on episode 9,000 of 10,000, so that's pretty good. Um, now, as you can see, this uh, the average reward started out very bad and it's sort of, you know, skyrocketed and then it's sort of stabilized asymptotically a little bit and I'm sure that will be reflected in the plot once we're done here, but uh, we're gonna wait a few more minutes. All right, we're actually, you know, just in the cusp of time getting some fantastic results. Uh, our average reward is down to negative 90, which is pretty impressive. So in a bit, we're gonna get a window popping up. Oh, there it is. I missed it. Um, I'm pretty sure it was getting to the flag every time. I can't say for certain though. But uh, here, we're going to plot our results, and yeah, look at that. So you can see it sort of trended up, but it kind of fluctuated a lot. Then it sort of stabilized. Then it must have learned something around the 900th or 9,000th episode, and it just the average board just started skyrocketing. So that's kind of good. That's sort of the behavior you want to see. Uh, even as late as episode 9,000, it was still able to learn something new that sort of gave it a much better reward and, you know, didn't stabilize at a subpar value. Um, 
I would have liked to have done, you know, maybe 50,000 just to see if it stays like this, but this is still pretty good. Uh, and now we're actually going to plot our uh, Q table again. And let me explain a bit more now that it's clear what the Q table actually is in this program at least. Um, here are all of our states and each color dot represents one of the actions. Red is move right, blue is do nothing, and lime green is move left. Now, um, as you can see, we started out with very even uh, quantities of each of these being recommended by the Q table, 51, 50, and 51. Now, as our Q table learned, uh, we actually got a lot more of move right nodes. Our move left node stayed about the same, they just moved around, but the amount stayed the same. Um, our stand still nodes, you know, they they reduced the number quite a bit, you know, there are 14 fewer of them now, so uh, that that's blue. There is a lot less blue in this graph, and uh, that's because, you know, staying still doesn't tend to accomplish your goal of getting to the flag in most cases. So yeah, that's pretty much the project. Um, that was, uh, all, that's all my code and that's how I went about solving it. Um, if you have any questions, let me know and uh, thank you for listening.